in the book of 2 Samuel about a fellow named Mephibosheth. Y'all will say that with me real quick three times. Mephibosheth. He was the son of David's best friend, Jonathan, and the grandson of King Saul, Israel's first king. Mephibosheth was five years old when both Saul and Jonathan died in a battle at Mount Gilboa. When news of their death reached the capital, Mephibosheth's nurse picked him up to flee the city, and in doing so, she dropped the little boy and injured both his feet and rendered him lame for life. Now, David loved Jonathan, and when he became king, he wanted to know if there were any descendants to whom he could show kindness for Jonathan's sake. When he learned about Mephibosheth, he had him brought to the king's palace from the meager place where he had been hiding lo, these many years. He basically adopted him as one of his own sons, a king's son. So overnight, Mephibosheth went from poverty to the royalty. From a primitive shack, it's estimated in, in the land called Lodibar, which means nothing grows here or emptiness. From primitive sleeping arrangements to a bedroom fit for a prince. From meager provisions to eating at the king's table. From a place of fearfulness to one of security. Now, why did he suddenly find himself basking in the blessings of the king of Israel? Because of covenant love. Because of David's love for and his covenant with Jonathan. This is one of the many biblical stories that serves as a metaphor for God's covenant love to us. We, like Mephibosheth, can find ourselves the recipients of blessings beyond our imaginations. Blessings poured upon us by a king, the king of kings, the king of the universe. Now, how and why could we experience such extravagance? What is the secret to experiencing such extravagance? How can we receive this kind of blessings from the divine blesser of all. Deuteronomy 30, today's text, provides illumination to those questions. One way to summarize the chapter is this. Those who remember God's truth and do it and turn to Him with all their heart are the ones that will receive His blessings. So before delving into chapter 30, by way of review, let's consider some of the applicable lessons for Israel that we garnered from last week's message on, text, uh, on chapter 29. Moses' key messages to Israel in chapter 29 were these. Number one, he reminded them of their history with God. Two things about their history with God. God's faithfulness and their faithlessness. God was faithful. He gave them revelations, he delivered them from enemies, he provided for them in the wilderness, and their eyes saw this, Moses said, all the signs and the great wonders. But they were faithless on a number of occasions, not the least of which was at Mount Sinai while Moses was on top of the mountain. They built a golden calf and started worshiping it. At the waters of Meribah, there was incessant complaining that cost them and Moses dearly. At the border of Canaan, when they were ready finally to go in, they failed to believe God's promise that he would deliver the Canaanite into their hands. So Moses said, your failure to trust and obey the Lord has resulted in the Lord not giving you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Your current choice is what he covered next in that last chapter. What opportunity uh, do you have right now? Number one, renew your covenant with God and do so with all your heart and soul this time. Number two, beware that your heart is not turned away from the Lord. During the past 40 years, Moses says, you traveled from Egypt to the promised land and you saw many detestable, abominable practices of all those nations in between. Beware, it says, that there is not one among you, not one, whose heart turns away from the Lord to go and serve other gods one who says, when he hears the words of this curse, he says, I'll be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. I'll be all right, though I don't obey the commandments. Beware lest there be a root, starting with one person, bearing poisonous and bitter fruit that would necessitate God using the curses written in this book of the law as a means of correction. 
The New Testament saints receive a similar admonition from the author of Hebrews when it says in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And then he pulls from this verse in Deuteronomy that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. Moses warns that this bitter root could lead to complete desolation, for the curses of the book will lead to a land that is fruitless and desolate like the ashes of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the next generation, he says, your children and all the nations around are going to ask this question, why? Why did God do that to this people and to this land? And the answer, he says, will be because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served other gods and even worship them. The final lesson in Deuteronomy 29 was last week's focal point, telling us that what he has revealed is sufficient to trust him and obey him. Interestingly, that verse seems completely out of place, out of context, because if you take the verse right above it, verse 28, and then the first verse of chapter 30, they go right together where he says, uh, if you disobey God, he'll bring these curses upon you. And then when he's bring, brought these curses upon you, blah, blah, blah. And then we get her into chapter 30. But he throws this in. Like Paul did on a number of occasions with his epistles, there's a sudden inspiration of the Spirit for an important point. And even its position in the text emphasizes the importance. So the key of today's text, the focus of chapter 30, is indeed the focus of chapter 29, ultimately, and the whole book of Deuteronomy, and basically the entire biblical canon for that matter. That's this, our relationship with God. Notice how often when I read that chapter, it says, the Lord your God. Very personal link, very personal relationship. Fifteen times in 20 verses, the Lord your God. The first three chapters of chapter 30, the first three verses of chapter 30 provide a sort of prelude and summary of the rest of the chapter. So I'm going to read those first three verses again. It will come to pass... When all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, they will experience both blessing when they're obedient, curse when they're disobedient. When this has come upon you, call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord has driven you. Now, they were driven there because of the curse. He says, while you're sitting there, think back, remember your history, and remember where you went astray, where you got off the plumb line, because that is going to be important for you to be able to return. Call them to mind wherever you've been driven, and then return to the Lord and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and soul, so that, and then here's the result, the Lord will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you. And in fact, He'll gather you from all the nations where He scattered you, no matter how far away that is. In short, our thesis today is the message of those three verses. When you remember His word, and you return to him in obedience, he will bless you with deliverance and compassion. So let's consider those three elements one by one. Remember his word. Now the word remember is a marvelous word, very important and significant, that runs like a scarlet thread throughout the scripture. It's a key word. It's a key command. And it is the key to life. It is a key to living in the blessings of God. So much scripture, so many rituals... So many things that God gave to us, revealed to us, were revealed so that we could remember. There are many things that he says over and over again, just like he did in chapter 30. You notice how many things that he repeated himself for. And then he created festivals and rituals and dates and a sacrificial system that was meant all throughout the year to bring to memory what he told them. The Old Testament signs off with this message, remember the law of Moses. That's where we are today. Remember the law of Moses. Now, had the Sadducees and Pharisees of Jesus' day done that, they would have recognized Jesus as the Messiah because Jesus himself said, have you read of Moses? He spoke of me. Jesus is literally on every page. And when we remember all that he wrote, all that he revealed, it'll be a consistent revelation of the living word. All the feasts, all the sacrifices, all the prophecies, 
They were all designed to help God's people remember his redemptive plans and his purposes and thereby recognize the Messiah when he appeared. When you find yourself living under the curse, call to mind the things that God told you. Remember his word. What about his word? Well, God's word, as we looked at a moment ago, is the plumb line by which you evaluate your own history, your own current relationship with God, your family, your nation, everything. It's the plumb line. It's the standard. Use the plumb line to see when you get off track. The prophet Amos uses this analogy, as I mentioned to the children, in Amos 7, 7 through 9. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them anymore. Do you see that? That little space between those two phrases, what a big gap that is. I'm going to set a plumb line with my people Israel. Oops, I'm not going to pass by them anymore. What do you think he found when he dropped that plumb line? The high places of Isaac will be desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel will be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Life is a journey down one of only two paths. We want to make life more complicated than it is. But there are two paths, there are two ways, and that's it. There's the way of righteousness that leads to life, that's God's way, and then there are all the other ways that lead to death. They they look like lots of other ways, myriads of other options, but they're not. They all lead to the same place. All the other paths will only serve to divert you from the one way that he wants you to go. There's God's way and there's man's way. Only two choices. One leads to life, one leads to death. And the plumb line is a checkpoint to see if and where you veered off the straight and narrow way. Remember his word. Second, return to his covenant. Verse 2 says, return to the Lord your God. The word return, I love the word uh, because there was a song by a group called Lamb called Shu V. I don't know how the V fits in. It's some sort of alteration of the basic Hebrew root. But the Hebrew word is Shuv or Shuv as they pronounce it. It means return. And in Jeremiah 31, 21, the prophet Jeremiah says this, Set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. In other words, the way you left sets you up some signposts and, 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 and road marks to get back to where you were. Turn back, he says. That's the word return. Same word that he used in Deuteronomy. Turn back, O virgin of Israel. Turn back to these your cities, the cities that God gave you. Implied here is go back to the place where you veered off. Years ago, Andrew Peterson wrote a song for his son, who was very young at the time. He just graduated from college, I think now, I understand. But his son was young. And before he entered his teenage years, he wrote this song, offering this wise advice. As you grow up, quote, keep to the old roads and you'll find your way. Don't move the landmarks that your father set. If they learn something, where the wise men and the revelations of God pointed the way, follow it. The old roads, the proven roads. And in the last verse, he advised what to do when you get lost. He says this, go back, go back to the ancient paths. Lash your heart to the ancient mast. And hold on, boy, whatever you do, to the hope that's taken hold of you, and you'll find your way. If love is what you're looking for, the old roads lead to an open door, and you'll find your way back home. Return. Return to what? Well, return to his covenant, he says repeatedly in this chapter. Return to that love relationship. It's a love relationship. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's a covenant based on love. Our covenant of marriage, our covenant of romance and lifelong commitment is a reflection, is based on this covenant relationship with God. So he says, return with all your heart and soul. Three times in this chapter. In verse 2, return to the Lord with all your heart and soul. In verse 6, return and the Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love him with all your heart and soul. In verse 10, the Lord will again rejoice over you for good if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Don't hold anything back. 
Second, return why? To love him. Loving him is highlighted also three times in this chapter. In verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart to love him. In verse 15 and 16, I've set before you life and death, and I command you this day to love the Lord your God. And then in verse 19 and 20, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, so that both you and your descendants may love the Lord your God. But you not only return with all your heart, you not only return to love him, but you return for a purpose, to obey him. In verse 2, call these things to mind so that you can obey his voice. In verse 8, and you will again in that day obey the voice of the Lord and do his commandments. In verse 9 and 10, the Lord will rejoice over you if you obey the voice of the Lord to keep his commandments and his statutes written in the book of this law. And in verse 15 and 16, I've set before you life and good so that you may love the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. When you consider in these verses that Moses is referring to all the commandments that he's given in the Pentateuch, it can seem like a pretty daunting task. He says, keep all these commandments, keep all the statutes, keep every judgment. Well, you know, not counting Genesis, if you look into all of those commandments and judgments and laws and stipulations and precepts and all the other seven items that Psalm 119 uses to describe the Word of God, in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and then in Deuteronomy where he summarizes it, it's, it can seem pretty tedious, pretty daunting. But God Himself consolidated and summarized His laws with his own finger when he wrote on the two tablets that he gave to Moses. He gave them the big ten, the ten commandments on Mount Sinai that summarized his law and judgments. And when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, and all the law and the prophets is summed up in this. So it's really not quite as complicated as it seems, and especially for New Testament believers who are no longer obligated to maintain a sacrificial system. Returning to the Lord is not a difficult or mysterious concept. Notice in verse 11, 14, this interesting little um, subject. This commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far away. It's not in heaven that you should say, who's going to go up in heaven and bring it down to us so we can do it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you should say, who will go across the sea for us and bring it to us so we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you may do it. So when he says, keep all the commandments, it's not that tedious. It's relatively simple path. And it starts with loving him with all your heart, loving your neighbor as yourself. Now for us in the New Testament, Paul transposes, as it were, this truth of this text into a new covenant, a New Testament application in Romans 10, 4 through 10. Listen to what he says and how he pulls on this verse and applies it in a completely, what we might think is a bizarre way at first. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness for everyone who believes. This is the new covenant. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law when he says the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith that is the righteousness we now have through Christ, speaks this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? And then Paul adds, that is to bring Christ down from heaven, because he's the living word. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is, it's the word of faith, Paul says, that we are preaching. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. Now, in doing that, Paul gives you the secret of God's blessings, the secret of being in covenant with him, the secret of being saved. Believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth. And interestingly, he pulls from this chapter and from that mysterious... Um, part of those verses where, where Moses is saying, this is not too mysterious, it's not too difficult for you to understand. Uh, and Paul made it even more simple. Believe and confess. Before I go to the last point, when we're talking about returning to his covenant, one of the questions I ask is, why do we leave it? Why do we walk away? Why, after all those years of God 
sending plagues on Egypt to deliver them from that bondage, opening up the Red Sea so they could go through, conquering nation after nation. Now they're out there without any uh, means of supporting themselves, so he provides manna and provisions all along the way. And after all these years of doing that, they still keep failing. Turning to, and, and, and he tells them, don't, while you walk through these nations and when you conquer the Canaanites, don't uh, at all let the, their, their rituals, their practices, their culture turn your heart away. And yet they did. Why do we turn away from God? When you reflect on life, including the blessings and the curses that are natural consequences to good and evil behavior, and the fact that God has made the choice simple to understand and access, then you have to ask, what causes us to walk away? Why do we seem bent on walking on a path that leads to destruction? What causes you to leave a God who promises extravagant blessings for faithfulness? Why resist divine love for lesser loves who always have disappointed in the end? What lures us away? What causes us to continue down the road to hell? when that road is littered with so many previews of the disastrous consequences that lay ahead. Even the current results of rebellion are so horrific, they're like road signs warning us, go back, go back, go back. None of this is good for you. Well, there's a spirit of deception working in the world, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, Paul said, and we've all been disobedient. It's working in the world and it's vying for our affections day and night. It's, it's vying for our love and for our allegiance with ceaseless energy, with ceaseless determination. This enemy works to capture our attention with promises of pleasure and satisfaction. But they are promises he can never ultimately deliver because that ultimate joy and satisfaction can only come from the lover of our soul, the one who proved his love with a covenant commitment. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. The apostle John warned us not to love the world or the things in the world, for if we commit to loving the world, then the love of the Father is not in us. Jesus came into the world as light. He's the light of the world, illuminating the right path and the right way. But men, he said, love darkness rather than light, because the light exposed the evil in their heart. So we have an enemy working to pull us away, and then we have evil in our own heart. And that's why we turn off the path. If you turn off the light because you love darkness, guess what happens? You can't see where you're going, and you act like blind people. You end up walking in darkness. You're blind to reality. You're blind to the consequences. You're blind to the roadsides that say, turn around. You don't see the warning signs, though they're all around you. If you take the bait and you believe the first lie, just a little bit off of the standard, just a little shy of the plumb line, then you'll get snared with progressively bigger lies until you finally can't understand the truth even when it's right in front of you. That explains, for me, so much of what's going on. In my own life, when I'm un unquestionably, I'm going, how stupid is this decision? Or in the culture, when I look out and see what's happening. Think about it. What is the logic in choosing to love a world that is full of animosity, vengeance, and cruelty? a world that always disappoints us? And why love the things in the world that are temporal and all perish with the using? In doing so, why resist the love of a father who loved us so much he laid down his life for us, who rose from the dead to prove that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that he could actually keep his promises, promises that include a place prepared where there's no more sin, pain, tears, or death, promises to bring justice to an unjust world and to finally bring an end to all the lies and its chaos and its cruelty. Why indeed? It is certainly a testimony to the depth of our fallen nature and the deceptive nature of our enemy. But as we speak of the wonderful divine promises, let's move to the last point. Receive His blessing. Remember His word. Return to His covenant so that you can receive his blessing. So what are they? Moses mentions a bunch of blessings in this chapter. Here are some of them. He'll bring you back from captivity, the bondage you got into when you veered from the word. He'll prosper you and multiply you. He'll fix your heart. He'll do surgery on your heart, it says, so that you can now love him with all your heart. He will put the curses on your enemies who persecuted you, and he'll make you prosper in these ways, in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body or the womb, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the produce of your land. And then he says this, And then he will rejoice over you for good. 
as he rejoiced over your fathers. This delightful phrase, he will rejoice over you, is used in Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17. In a context where Zephaniah is describing similar blessings and deliverance for God's people, he says this. And listen carefully to how it describes God's character and action. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. For the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God in our midst, dwelling with us. The infinite living with the finite, rejoicing over us with gladness and singing. God singing over us. Now, how cool is that? To summarize, what is the blessing for remembering and returning to the Lord? It is a loving, joyous relationship with Him. In the last two verses, he says, so that both you and your descendants may live, so that you may love the Lord your God, obey His voice, and cling to Him, for He is your life. The end of all the commandments of the entire redemptive process, which Jesus completed through His death and resurrection, was an eternal love relationship with the God who is love, and whose love prompted this grand rescue mission to deliver us from the clutches of sin, death, and darkness. As Revelation 22 so beautifully and graphically portrays, He will bring us to a place He has prepared for us where we can live joyously with Him as His people forever, and He is our God. The last few verses in the chapter, Moses brings you to a choice. The conclusion that we have to deal with is that there is a choice set before you. Here's what Moses says. I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you to love the Lord your God, walk in His ways and keep His commandments. But if your heart turns away so you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods, I announce to you today you will perish. You will not prolong your days in the land. So I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God. All of life really consists of two choices, two paths, two roads. The choice Moses sets before us is blessing or curse, life or death, good and evil, prosperity or desolation. In the end, it's love or lovelessness. It's heaven or hell. Moses' admonition is simple. Choose life. Why will you die, he says in another place. And he calls heaven and earth as witnesses. These two choices seem to be a theme throughout Scripture. When Joshua, Moses' successor, ended his book, his charge to the Israelite was much the same as Moses. Listen to this. Therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Instead, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, well, choose you. Choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The psalmist consistently refers to paths of righteousness as opposed to the way of the wicked. One of the key themes in Solomon's book of Proverbs is the thinking, speech, and behavior of the wise man and the foolish man. Jesus refers to the two choices as the wide way and the narrow way. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be who go by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. It was difficult for him, but he made the way easy for us. He had to give his life and break the relationship with his father in that difficult way. And he calls, he calls us to carry our cross as well. But in carrying our cross with him in the yoke, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. A few key observations about our two choices. One, the seemingly minor choices matter. The two choices are not just what we consider in the big decisions of life, a big Mount Sinai or a Mount Nebo, once for all time choices, but they are embedded into our daily life. With virtually every choice we make, we either draw closer or further away from the plumb line. We're either getting nearer or further away from God's commandments, His standards. 
With every step, we are either drawing near or veering off the path of righteousness. And every choice has a consequence, even the little daily ones. If you step off the path of righteousness even slightly, you have angled yourself in a different direction. Even the smallest angle grows large over time as you continue down the path. And so often we fail to see the consequences of our choices. You've heard the saying, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle. Sow a lifestyle, reap a destiny. It starts with the thought. Little choices. Number two, your choices are greatly influenced by your companions. You become who you hang around. My son is reading a book, and he said, uh, the author said, uh, you will become the, who, the five best friends you have, the five people you hang around the most. This applies not just to, I think, physical presence of friends and acquaintances, but to the people you engage through music, movies, media, and books. When you're absorbed in their world through their means, when you fill your mind with their thoughts, and your heart is filled with their affections, and you do this more often and to a greater degree than meditating on what God says, you are in essence choosing their paths over God's, step by step, choice by choice, little by little. Are the things that capture their affections capturing yours? Materialism, immorality, narcissism, bankrupt philosophies? When you dig into the lives of most of the popular heroes of the day, you don't find good fruit. And you don't have to dig very deep. Lives full of addiction, affairs, fudging the truth in their relationships and in their line of work, spreading gossip, spreading discontent, spewing unkind, hateful words, full of lust, full of deceit, ungrateful and unthankful, and spending their time on personal pleasure instead of helping others in need. Are these the kind of folks you listen to and hang out with? Is this the path you're walking? Are these the choices you're making, all the little choices every day? If so, you've chosen poorly. He that walks with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools is soon destroyed. So choose to hang around and read and, and, and absorb the uh, thoughts and the truths of those who are bearing good fruit, those who are choosing life. History and culture have plenty of good examples of faithful, obedient saints who are changing the world. In fact, Christianity has been the chief influencer of good in the world since Jesus began sending out his disciples. They're, they are typically the ones who have built the orphanages, built the hospitals, cared for the sick, visited prisoners, offered hope to the afflicted, comforted and housed the elderly, rescued infants from sacrificial altars. They dug the wells and supplied food for poor villagers. They rescued women and children from human slavery, and they created governments that freed men from tyranny and totalitarianism. If you want to be amazed at the difference Jesus made in the world, there are several books on that subject. Check out the history before he came. And then after he came, you can go back even further and see the influence of God's word and how it impacted history by checking out the history before Moses and after Moses wrote the law in 1400 B.C. Remember, it was so bad at one point, God had to destroy the whole world with a flood because they would have destroyed themselves with a more horrific and hideous demise than even drowning. Ironic, isn't it, that many in today's world are blaming religion, and in particular Christianity, for the evils and injustices around us, when, in fact, those most committed to biblical truths, those who are actually following God's commandments, are the ones more fervently and effectively fighting these evils. They're the ones that defeated these evils in the past. They're the ones that created societies with foundational truths that helped flag and eliminate these evils. Societies that provided freedoms and justice, that which everyone longs for. So spend time reading their stories, their books, engage those lives, line up with the plumb line, measure it by the word of truth. When I think about folks I want to be like, I think of my parents. You know this is going to be hard for me because I have a hard time anyway with this kind of stuff. They are the most loving folks I've ever known. I want to love as they have loved. I feel so privileged that God gave me the parents that I have. As far back as I remember, they were always loving, my brother and I. They always loved their parents. They took care of their parents. They took care of their siblings when they went astray. They took care of neighbors. They were always giving, always serving, always forgiving before being asked, and even if they were never asked. Always compassionate, kind, and gentle. Always responding with mercy and patience. Never bitter never holding a grudge. They've always been there for my brother and I, always willing to listen. 
We always knew we could go home, no matter what. Their love was always unconditional. They demonstrated a lifetime of faithfulness to one another, loving each other till death parted them, and beyond, still loving, as if love really was meant to last forever. Now that's some good fruit. Where did that kind of character and goodness and faithfulness come from? It's because they sowed seeds of faith. They remembered God's word. They turned to the Lord with their heart, and they resulted, this resulted in receiving his gracious blessings all throughout their life. Well, man, I'll plant myself there where they are planted. I'll walk that path. I choose that life. That's where the blessings of God are now and in eternity.